Hi, I'm Sarah Betcher. I'm an Alaskan ethnographic filmmaker and owner of Farthest North Films. For the last couple years, I've been working as the filmmaker for Sustainable Futures North, based primarily at the University of Alaska Fairbanks, a project that explores interactions among food, water, energy security, and community sustainability. I directed, filmed, and edited Tied to the Land, Voices from Northwest Alaska. This six-part film series showcases how 10 Northwest Alaskan villages are seeking ways of adapting to rapid changes in climate, weather, and development. You will be immersed into the daily lives of active hunters, fishers, and gatherers by air, land, and sea. The scenes and interviews come from footage captured during the summer of 2013 into the fall, winter, spring, and completing after the summer of 2014. Filming began after getting approval from the regional tribe, support from the Northwest Arctic Borough, and establishing close ties with community members. Viewers of the six-part film series will have the opportunity to build a deeper understanding of how people in Northwest Alaska are deeply tied to the land through ancestry, tradition, and economics, and how these ties are being challenged by rapid change in the remote north. And I hope you enjoy watching Tied to the Land film series. It certainly is about food security. People's first and foremost concerns here, politically, socially, and spiritually, is subsistence. And subsistence isn't merely hunting and fishing. It's about a life way that ties the essence of who we are as a people to the land. I watch the ice as I go out there and you're looking at um, thinner ice with the warming. Even though this year we had a cooler winter, the ice was not as thick as we thought it was going to be. Moisture on this side, so it's good. Just right here is a little overflow. When I was younger, the sea ice started forming mid-October, end of October and it lasted all the way into June. But now it's mid-December, end of December, and breakup is starting early as mid-April, beginning of May. The ice every spring is getting thinner and thinner. Now sometimes the ice comes into the shore and blocks them out, and there's no way for you to get back home till it's gone. We start carrying tents even. So if we have to put the tent up in a boat, just try to wait for you know, the ice to move back out and wait it out. The ice is getting thinner. It doesn't stay around very long anymore. We don't have as much time to hunt. I went out here and crabbed in the springtime, make holes in the ice and put my small crab pots out there. And uh, it never got more than two and a half foot thick. And normally it's up to five feet thick. This time of the year, it would all be frozen and we'd be out tomcotting. Then we got this warm spell, which disrupted all our plans. Because we travel on the ice and it's all trails between villages, it really affects us. These falls, like right now, where it's supposed to be freezing up and it's warm and rainy, makes a longer and longer period of no winter trails. And then when they do form, often they're they're really dangerous because we'll have some ice and then it snows and rains a bunch on top of it. And we're seeing that more and more. Living in the Arctic, you're asking for unpredictable weather, but the volume's turned up on that. Maybe 10, 15 years ago, three elders went out hunting out on the ice just to go seal hunting in the springtime, and they fell through the ice in conditions that were not expected. They would have known the conditions, but things changed so very much that the local traditional knowledge of the ice conditions have changed, so it's an uncertainty now. It used to be really cold and thick ice around here in springtime. Nowadays the ice is real thin, about four feet, and water's all over. Lots of belugas and whales used to go through here. Today it retreats back over three to four hundred miles. 
used to only reach 80 to 100 miles. Today, when we get the northwest wind, it does more damage to our land because there's 400 miles of open water and the waves get big and just... There's going to be a segment of the population that they're always out there hunting and fishing. In a way, they're kind of the eyes and the ears for the rest of the community as to what may be happening or not happening, those locations that they're going to. And sometimes we have to move to get more. But right now, it's nice out. It's good to be hunting slow instead of getting six, seven at a time. That way I can keep up with cleaning. There were some tracks coming out, so some guys came out not that long ago. When they find out I'm out here, they figure it's safe as I come back home. One of the things that we think would be valuable is the Canadian version of their Department of Transportation. In Canada, they use the waterways for highways during the winter, the same way we use waterways for travel. We need to invest in the equipment that allows us to go and make a computerized model of the ice thickness along a particular path. Being able to do that on an annual basis can improve safety for our people. In between lakes, there's waterways and there's water moving in between lakes. If it's eight inches here, it's not necessarily eight inches there because the current in the water that's moving through there is keeping it thinner. Checking or verifying that those locations like this, uh, like that, are actually safe enough and then you GPS that route, and then you're, you've added an extra level of security using technology. Here at the borough, we'll stake the winter trails for about six months every spring. Trying to maintain a level of safety for travelers, and it's becoming later and later that we stake those winter trails. We don't stake it until we know it's thick enough. It's whether it's blizzard at night or whatever, they can find their way, and when they hit the trails, It'll help them get to safety. This trail has not really been used this winter to NOTAC. There's just not enough snow. That's uh, one of the most direct routes. There's a trail that runs here, then runs across the lake to those villages. There's a trail that runs here, crosses an overland portage, runs here and up the river. We have search and rescue efforts here that are very, very important to our traveling. We travel so much of the time of the year by snow machine, the other time of the year by boat in addition to airplanes. Each community has search and rescue. Uh, and it's, in almost every case, it's all volunteer. We were able to get some funds for a regional search and rescue to help them with gas and with equipment and construct shelter cabins along the way for people who may not be able to make it to their final destination, but there's a waypoint that they could seek shelter and have heat and, and ride out a storm if necessary. Another transportation route. There's an ice road that gets uh, opened up every March and April, and that ice road runs into the Kobuk River, runs all the way up to Norvik, and then on up to Kayana. trying to impact Arctic policy from a local perspective, that whoever is funding the research is also funding a combination of Western and local traditional knowledge. During a fall storm. Being provided to the same research project. The pressure ridge, come up to breathe. At the end of the day, we, we're part of a product, and we could be part of helping shape our research projects, so the value that we take away from it is a product that becomes useful and valuable to us who are going to continue to live here. Most of us, I think, are very worried about the whole process and the whole thought of developing some of our oil resources in a very fragile environment. To do it on land is fragile enough, but we depend on so much of our food sources from the ocean, seals, fish whales and it's such a large part of a diet that it causes a lot of concern.
Living here is not easy. We are plagued with the challenge of adaptation. We have people who are here because of the ability to be resilient, to live in some of the harshest climate anywhere and thrive, or at least eke out a way. That's pretty amazing. So I think we're at the right place, right time, to be a little bit more vocal about what's in it for us when it comes to non-renewable resource development. I'm optimistic about our future because we wouldn't be here if we didn't have the ability to adapt and to be resilient.